do it as we get a picture on here. Mark Jensen and I just want to put him on the face corner and call him Fred Well, we wanted to start enforcing weight. I don't think we scratched break up. He thought we were going after him. No, Everett was fairly good too. I mean, yeah. Nygaard, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I got lost. Email. Somebody in my mail. Good luck. So Jim's not. Yep, that was it. Jim's not in Florida. They got some house to go down there. We can rent it out or something. What did he do? He was down there. When I get my card, he doesn't make it as far as I can share screen at that point and try to get money we need. Counties only. I mean, I count the. Really, it's better. One night can be available for all counties. We've got some extra money from that. Just to make sure they come back. Is it anybody on this committee change? I'm, I'm just, yeah, with the new. No, I'm in the water. This was almost. All right, we ready? Yep. Ready. Four of us are still on. Oh, two or three. Okay. Diane, oh, says, Diane says, I have to call this meeting to order because there's no chairman. Yeah, right you're right. <laughs> So it is 8.35 and I'll call this land and water conservation meeting to order. Uh, roll call indicates that we have five members in person and two on Zoom, which would mean everybody's here. Um, we need to review and approve the agenda from May 4th. And again, I would entertain a motion to get rid of public comment because I left it on there for a second month in a row. All right, so move to approve the agenda with the removal of the public comment. Second. Okay, motion's been made and seconded to approve the agenda with the removal of public comment. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, approve the minutes of the previous meeting. I guess I said that before. <laughs> we were approving the agenda. Now that you that did. Happened. Jim Nygaard, I will make that motion to approve the meetings, the minutes of the last meeting. Bob Ellis, I'll second that. All right, motion's been made and seconded to approve the minutes of the previous meeting. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Election of chair. We would need nominations for the chair of this committee. Come I on. would nominate Dwayne Fitz. I second that. Okay, there's been a nomination for Dwayne Federwitz. Are there any other nominations? Are there any other nominations? And one last time, are there any other nominations for chair? Jim Nygaard, Brian, I'm gonna make a motion that we cast a unanimous ballot for Dwayne Federwitz as chairman of Land and Water. Thank you, Jim. That needs a second, I'll second it. Okay, unanimous ballot has been cast. Mr. Chairman, she's all yours. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, committee. I appreciate that a vote of confidence. Uh, do the best I can. And welcome to a couple of Zoom numbers here for our committee. Uh, don't know, do we all know? Uh, Bernie, did you weren't here when they introduced themselves at our no. county board meeting? So maybe. For the sake of just a little background, just tell us what district and a little bit about this completely. Um, part of it, you know, we're looking for our green moss. I'm sitting right. Um, part of the green moss is the land use and the green moss. 
been on a family farm for a hundred years and looking forward to learning about this. And doing an addition and helping with this. Um, Bernie knows. Can you make District 22 and then Bob Lee's old district? I've been born through this. I've never been involved in local government. I attended town board meetings, but I came to a couple of county meetings. No. This is a new road. I, Something is on top of me. Going on. There's a lot of stuff right I'm back here, but just looking forward to meeting everybody and getting along. Thank you. Um, at this time, we've got to get a vice chair. We do. Nominations open for vice chair. Bob, unmute yourself. I muted him, but I can't unmute him. <laughs> Brian, is Bob Ellis, Ellis interested in doing it again? I suspect he is, Jim. Okay. Huh. There you are. There I am. <laughs> yes, okay, I'm now. interested. Whatever that means. Uh, we opened up for vice chair and Jim Nygaard. Were you going to say more on that? Or? Yeah, I'll, I'll nominate Bob Ellis now when he's unmuted and he can decline it if he wants to. <laughs> I will not decline. I'll second that. Okay, there's been a motion and a second for vice chair. For Bob Ellis, any other nominations for vice chair? One more time. Any other nominations for vice chair? Hearing none, there'd be an order for someone to make a motion to cast the unanimous ballot. Make a motion to cast the unanimous ballot for Bob Ellis. Is there a second? I second. Okay. We have a motion and a second to cast an anonymous ballot for Bob Ellis as vice chair. Bob, you're vice chair. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Um, we did start here a little bit with introduction of the new committee members. Um, I don't know, Bob, were you able to hear any of that or not? Yeah, I heard a little, but that's right about when I went off the air. It's okay. Okay. Uh, Brian, did you have anything else you wanted to share with the new members right now? I, I didn't. I sent them an email with some extra stuff in it that the rest of you didn't get. I guess if you had any questions, otherwise you can always bother me at a later date if you want to talk about any of that. Sent out our ordinance, Chapter 92, some various stuff. I do have paper copies here of our land and water handbooks that they print for us every year. Well, can we uh, copy of the senators for the new members? I guess I would uh, echo what Supervisor Yeager said earlier that. Uh, coming on the county board. I don't know, it took me over a year just to figure out where I belong. You know, you got to try to get an idea. It functions different than a town board. Okay. The inside of the back page of that booklet has a list of acronyms that we sometimes speak in gibberish around here. <laughs> Okay, uh, there is no public comment that was stated at this point. Uh, introduction we did, and then agency reports. Uh, Lisa, are you on there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? I can't see you very well today. It's very bright, it's very bright, very bright it's behind you. I think so. it's a background or something. I don't know. I'm near a window. Maybe that's the problem. Okay. Go ahead. Tell us some good news. 
Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, well, to start off with, we are still um, relatively shut down at our service center. We do have staff that rotate in and out every day. However, we're still close to the public. Um, we don't have the proper cleaning masks or um, hand sanitizer yet. So we can't open up until we have the supplies and until the until we have a 14 day continuous drop in positive cases in the county. So um, it's probably gonna be a little while until we're back open on our regular um, on a regular basis. But staff is still coming in and we're still getting our work done. Uh, we're just making sure that we don't have a whole lot of um, public contact. Just move this a little bit here. Um, as far as practices go that were completed last month since the last meeting, we had uh, a couple fencing for rotational grazing projects that were finished up. Um, one brush management project that was completed and we had three no-till contracts that were also completed. We are still in the process of checking some fields for that, um, for those practices. So we're still doing field checks because people are just getting done planting now. So um, on one positive note, we have started getting funding for our equip contracts from the last sign up. So Derek and I are working on getting those contracts developed for the people that were approved for funding. Um, funding, as you probably know from the past, kind of trickles in slowly. They fund some projects and, and wait on funding for others. So, um, so far, I wanted to give you an update of some of the projects that we've got gotten funding for so far. Uh, we've gotten funding for six comprehensive nutrient management plans. Uh, as you know, those plans are required if they want to go ahead in the future to do any manure management projects. So those are a prerequisite for those. Um, so six were funded. We had two no-till applications funded. Rather large acreages, actually. I think we're up somewhere around three or 4,000 acres when you add those all up. Um, five cover crop applications were funded. Um, we had, for the first time, two projects that are going, going to include low disturbance manure application. So that is a um, practice where they either retrofit or buy a new unit uh, to apply their manure. So the, minim so the residue is disturbance is minimized when they apply that. So it's, it's not surface application, it's not injection, it's kind of a uh, combination of the two and uh, that way they can apply manure on living cover and the manure does not run off typically and the cover is also maintained. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. And we have a um, couple of producers who are delving into that. So they, it was good to see that they got approved for funding for that project. So we're gonna be keeping our eye on those. Lisa, just, Lisa, just a question on that. Is that manure fairly liquid then? Yes, this would be um, pumping out of a, a liquid manure storage facility. So yeah, it's been agitated. It's pretty, it would, it would be considered liquid manure, yes. I mean, I guess what I'm trying to think of the application, I mean, is it, uh, what type of machine is it that puts it on? Brian, do you wanna go into that? Maybe they can hear you better. Yeah, so it's, um... Trying to think, Dwayne, did we see that machine out at Erickson's last September? I believe it was sitting there. I think it was just sitting there. Yeah, we we had I wanted to dance too, Brian, remember? Right, we had brought out a Gamies uh, machine into Dan Burst last summer for the field day out there, but it's um, they make them in either a three point or a pull behind um, machine that's hooked up to a manure hose. I guess you could also mount them on the back of a tanker, but it's um, looks a little bit like a planter with a, almost with a double disc opener or a single disc, disc opener that's run and the manure is injected in almost like the seeds would be in a planter. Um, they probably get a, 
five, six inches of penetration, um, oftentimes using a slightly lower rate of manure. But uh, by and large, DNR has allowed this, um, especially for CAFOs, uh, to up their manure application. I know we had been at a site two years ago near my house where uh, a CAFO down in Pine River had um, applied after every hay crop on the, on the living hay field and the, there was not enough damage to damage the hay. I mean, I, you know, are, were there some crowns that were broke on the hay? Probably some crown damage, but for the two or three years they keep hay in rotation, it just wasn't a, an issue there. So they were able to inject on that living crop after, after each cutting. Um, similar things are being done in the other demo networks. They're injecting into rye in the fall, uh, and you can cut rye in the spring. So, so what would be the advantage of that over the some of them that are thinking of doing the irrigation of it? Similar, other than the potential runoff for the irrigation, or yeah, there there probably is a, more of a potential for runoff for irrigation. Although DNR has been giving variances out to CAFO sized farms to use dribble bars, which would be essentially a tractor pull behind irrigation um, where it's dribbled on. I, I think, you know, a true irrigation, the difference would be that you're, you're limited to, to where that travel gun could be if you're gonna put it on with a traveling gun. Um, and if you're going to use a pivot, I guess you'd have to strain. I don't know if anybody's doing that yet, but you'd have to strain the manure to get the solids out of it to run through. Those traveling guns can handle the percent solids, but you're still limited to that equipment. So this, this low disturbance <laughs> manure injector looks more like standard manure hauler equipment. You know, it's, it's just another type of toolbar they're using to apply the manure. One, one that's less like a chisel plow and, and more like a no-till drill. That'd be my, my best example to put it. So. How many gallons are they putting on with something like this? It's going to be much of it. Um, you know, I think the sweet spot is between 8,000 and 12,000. Yeah. Although I've seen them put... Yeah. Don't they normally only put like 4,800-gallons on a year? No, most of the time they're probably running 14 to 17,000 gallons per acre, sometimes upwards of 20. So this thing can inject another 8,000 to 10,000 gallons into a hay field? I didn't hear the question, Brian. Bernie said they can inject, he was asking if they can inject eight to 12,000 into a hay field. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sure. I'll just um, I'll keep going with my list of um, projects that got approved. Um, we had three deer exclosure fence projects, and one also has an invasive brush management control um, aspect to it. Um, we had two filter strip projects. Um, I think I discussed those last meeting, but one of them came out to be about 46 acres of buffer strips along ditches. So that's, uh, that's a big one. That's exciting. Um, two forest management plans, uh, two water and sediment control basin projects. Um, and actually that's three, I'm sorry, three water and sediment control basin projects and three grazing projects. Um, we'll probably get more funding coming in, but as of today, that's what's come in so far. Um, once we receive funding for those, we put together maps, plans, uh, job sheets. Um, the guys put together construction plans for us. Um, so after they get funded, there's probably about a half a day to a day's work for each one of these. So it's, um, it's kind of all we've been working on lately. Um, for the sake of, of the new supervisors, I'm just going to back up a second here. Okay. So, you know, Lisa works for the federal agency across the street, NRCS. Um, our department and hers work together on almost everything. We actually have a contribution agreement where our technicians 
do a lot of her work. She doesn't have the staff to do that work, but yet the feds have very good program money, um, sometimes one to two signups a year for these projects. So, you know, where we have staff and sometimes not enough money, they've got money and not enough staff. So um, mm -hmm. by working together, we, we try to make the most of these programs. One of the things though with the federal programs since 9-11 is that um, for security or perceived security reasons, we're not allowed to discuss who these landowners are in public with her programs. Now our programs, we will do that. You'll hear landowner names, farmer names, but with federal programs, their, their identities are protected. So. Lisa, just go back to those grazing. Were those all for dairy or some for beef too? Um, let's see, they are all for beef this year. Yeah, I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very prices. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, the last item I have is just a recap of the conservation stewardship program. Uh, we did finish up with three renewal applications for people who had previous contracts. So those um, are getting signed now. And there was a second conservation stewardship program sign up and that ended on Friday. And we received seven applications for that program. Um, and for the benefit of the new members, the Conservation Stewardship Program is a program where farmers get uh, payments for, for conservation measures that they already have in place at the time of the sign-up. So um, the more no-till, um, you know, nutrient management, conservation, um, you know, erosion control that they've done in the past, the higher their chances are of getting accepted and also funded in the program. So um, so we've got seven new ones for that and we're gonna be working on those this summer too. And I guess one thing I did, um, I should mention is that we are gonna be getting oh, a, we, we are gonna be getting an intern this summer. Um, this person was supposed to be finishing up her internship in Washington, but because of the pandemic, they've allowed her to come back to her home state and finish the summer up here. So um, I will probably bring her to the next meeting so you all can meet her. And that's all I have. Lisa, just a question, and I'm not sure if you can give a good answer. Um, with all of the issues with um, programs that are out there for giving help to different places, whether it's civic government, farmers, do you have any idea what kind of programs are out there for helping farmers through this, like dairy or beef or anything? Yeah, actually, I don't deal with those, Dwayne, but um, the Farm Service Agency staff has been really busy with that. They have um, two or three programs that provide um, relief to farmers right now, and um, they're taking signups for those programs as we speak. So if you have anyone who might qualify for that, that you know of, just have them call the Farm Service Agency office and they'll get them signed up for whatever applies to them. Okay, the only reason I mentioned that was kind of sad here. A week ago, I got a call from the Sheriff's Department being the town chairman. And there was, uh, you know, five dead Holstein calves in the ditch. Mm. Uh, you know, I, why the farmer didn't just bury him on his property, I don't know. But then talking to another individual after church yesterday, uh, he said the cost now of getting a cold cow is $30 just to pick it up from crow, just 30 bucks for the cow alone. Hmm. So it's kind of a, it, an unusual situation out there. Okay. Um, NRCS does have an emergency mortality sign up going on right now, and that's if you have to, uh, at the advice of your, your vet or your herd manager or some, you know, other professional on the farm, um, that you have to call your herd down significantly. Um, NRCS is offering cost sharing for either disposal, composting, um, on-site disposal, landfilling, that kind of thing. So. If it gets, if they get in a pickle and they definitely need to call their herd, they can give us a call and we can provide help for that rather than throwing them in the ditch. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Anybody here have any questions for Lisa? This is back to the north with the 14 to 17,000, 20,000 gallons per acre. Do they do that at least once? Can you do it once a season or how does that work? Um, the, uh, the rate would be dependent on what their nutrient management plan says. Um, some of the CAFOs are doing several applications a year with the low disturbance equipment. Like, like I mentioned, they're doing it on, on hay cuttings after each cutting. So, so some of those fields are seeing three applications a summer. When they're doing that though, the application rate is probably closer to that seven to 10,000 gallon range. So you're gonna want to put on a maximum amount. Yeah, but the maximum amount varies within their nutrient management plan. It, it would be very difficult to put a label on that maximum amount, depending on which field you're talking about and you know what you have. So within the nutrient management plan, they have to test their manure to know what the NP and K is within it. Um, and they have to test the soil once every four years on every field on a five acre basis. So th those things all come into play on what those application rates are. So that gets registered with you then? So they can't over apply? Yeah, we, we have all the nutrient management plans on file that uh, uh, for those that are doing them, the county is only at around 50 to 55% compliance with nutrient management planning right now. But um, you know, if you're talking about the bigger farms, most of those have them, the bigger dairies, the, the permitted dairies, what we call CAFOs, the DNR permit, are required. So, uh, so a lot of those are on file. You know, do we pay a lot of attention to that? No, not unless there's a complaint made. I mean, there's, there's not enough staff in the world to, to chase manure rates, application rates around in the county. So. Is there a weight limit that those larger well, the, yeah, the semi tankers are limited to 92,000 pounds. Brian, I've got another commitment at nine. I'm going to have to leave you. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Thanks, everybody. Yep, Thank thanks. You. Yeah. Any other questions? I guess it seems that uh, like your clay soil, you're not going to be able to inject that much into them because you can't uh, remove it as quickly. But your sand fields, in the course of the year, how much manure could an individual have to apply to those sand fields? Well, it, again, it depends on what the phosphorus and, and the potash requirements are called for. Nutrient management plans are, are always built to the to phosphorus right now, that's the limiting factor. Um, 20 years ago when, when all of this started, it was nitrogen, but you know, we realized that phosphorus is the, the issue in Green Bay, Lake Winnebago and our waterways. So phosphorus is the limiting factor. You'll find that probably a majority of the egg fields out there are already high in phosphorus on their soil tests. So then they're generally limited to the amount of phosphorus that the particular crop on that field can take in a, in a year's time. That's the limiting factor. I think so. You know, sometimes we get, I come from a farm originally, so uh, I grew up on a farm in Trimble County, but the point is, I feel like by my house now, but by Clintonville there, I think this summer, you know, I think one day we counted a hundred parts. That's, what, that's so, what I'm concerned about. But the, the thing is, you gotta keep in mind that there's an awful lot of water in those charts. An awful lot of water. I mean, that's the bulk of it. And um, up there, you know, I, I got a call from an individual. Oh, they're polluting, polluting my well. Well, they haven't polluted as well, but that, that's his impression because they see all these trucks go by. Um, but again, there can be devious people out there. You Don't can, get me wrong. You know, when you're looking at the large tankers going by, if you're talking about semi tankers, and you assume that. A tanker has 5,000 gallons in it, and, and you know it's pretty typical um, for a dairy to be putting on 15,000 gallons in a spring or a fall application. So you're looking at three semis per acre. You know if they're pulling into a large field, say a 60-acre field. Well, if you do the math on that, you're talking about 180 semi loads on that field. Yeah. 
So you you said ninety two thousand pounds. Yeah, that's 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 the highway wage the limit, right? See, the see me on the board for the town, and then also I'm making I'm thinking about two in the roads. That's why I'm trying to right. figure out how much these guys can pay, right? Because they're ripping the roads up. Yeah, yeah I mean, eight spring when it's wet and there's rules yeah. can't take the weight right. when the farmers have to get rid of the rain. Yeah, that's just the hard part. Okay, thank you. That's why you see more and more hose applications. I know Casey at the highway department has been going out of his way to install culverts on county roads where you can get hoses under the, under the culvert and through the, yeah, because the, in his opinion, the cost of putting the culvert in is, is much better than fixing the roads. So. Okay. FSA. Uh, no contact from FSA. Haven't heard from them in a while. So. How, how can we ever get some contact? <laughs> Hard, hard to ask a question. But who's on the committee? Craig is. What, what made you think of it? I mean, or don't just me. We have a teleconference today after this meeting. So that's her going to be her last. And then we're getting the guy from Portage County. <clears throat> and they were just educated on this new government program last. They're always the last to know. I don't know if any of you are on Greg Blotty's email list, but Greg's, I, I, Greg's been going out in a flurry here the last few weeks with, he's been putting out a lot of the federal program um, stuff, information out there. So. so the new ones here, do you understand the FSA? How we're doing it? Yes. Okay. All right, uh, meeting reports for me. Our demo farm network monthly call occurred. Um, it's going to be an odd year in the demo farm network, you know, a, a network that depends on uh, public events and, and on farm sessions. I, I just don't know that we're going to get very far with, with the public aspect of that this year. Um, within the county, our network, uh, we had a a little get together at Dan Burst last week to look at a, a new no-till drill that uh, one of the neighbors had that we were demoing there. Um, we still have that UW extension position coming for the demo network. Um, but I think, you know, extension is sort of, nobody knows what's going on there right now. I mean, there's not, uh, they're ordered to not be in the office as far as I know, so. I don't know that the hiring process is moving along real quickly for that. Um, maybe a little background, I guess, for Cindy and Ken. We, two years ago, um, NRCS has been doing these demonstration farm networks, and, and the theory behind it is that they're picking good farmers and trying to host field days, trying to get satellite farms around these, these areas to do um, new practices, a lot of it revolves around soil health practices, um, more cover crops, more no-till planting, more low disturbance manure application, if that's the type of farm they are. Um, the lower fox up around Wrightstown has been having some very good success with this over the last number of years. And NRCS um, asked Wapaka to be the financial host for a a demonstration farm network grant for the Upper Fox Wolf Basin, which includes everybody from Green Lake and Fond du Lac up to Shawano and over to Portage County right now. So we've got a 10 farm network over eight counties um, funded by NRCS and partially funded by us, the counties, uh, do these type of things. And, and they they rely a lot on having these field events at the farms. And last year was our first year here. Um, we had a handful of events kind of just getting started. And now with the advent of COVID-19, we're kind of stuck in the rut here. Um, I know Green Lake had planned some events later in the summer um, around their demo farm. They don't, they don't expect it this year, I guess. So. 
nevertheless, um, we, we have a contract that uh, agronomists to work with these farmers and then uh, Derek who works with Lisa at NRCS. Those two guys are basically the project managers and they're out working with these folks. Um, so that's still occurring behind the scenes pretty regularly. Um, working on new and different projects. Uh, just We're probably going to end up doing YouTube videos and different ways to show these things and, and to promote some of this. Um, doing some drone footage last week of this new hotel plant. Um, a lot of that stuff will end up on the website, which is linked to our county website. You can see that later. But we have a, a part of our contribution agreement with NRCS is that we have to have a, a monthly call-in meeting among the eight counties that are participating in this project. So we, we do that every month. And so yeah, I have something to say about it. So. And the other uh, meeting I had taken part in two weeks ago was kind of a quick impromptu uh, get together on, on Zoom from Matt Kruger from Wisconsin Land and Water Wisconsin Land and Water had been approached by Senator Baldwin. <clears throat> Apparently there's a possibility of, of some more federal funding coming to Wisconsin to help farmers. It's called the Farming Support States Act. Um, you know, whether or not it happens isn't, I, I don't have any idea yet, but they had given us a list of seven or eight things here um, to comment on and uh, you know, some of them were low interest loans and things that really aren't our bailiwick and conservation. Um, there were a few items on here, uh, adding money to the conservation reserve program. I don't know if we felt real strongly about that because it's a long term program and it's a short term. They made the same comment about farmland preservation tax credit. They were looking at bumping that up to $25 an acre from the current 10. And you know, our question there is where does that leave the state? If that's a one year deal, um, <clears throat> we don't wanna leave the state hung up with that commitment. There's also a lot of statutory stuff that would have to change within Wisconsin in order to change the rate that farmland preservation is, is being uh, put out there at. Th there were some good ideas though. Um, you know, we, we talked about putting money into managed pastures, harvestable buffers, other conservation practices, you know, where, where DNR and DATCAP could get that money distributed to the counties in a, a quick fashion. So that, that was kind of what came out of that uh, cover crops, that type of stuff. So I don't know what will become of that, but I'm sure we'll hear about it if it gets here. Golden Sands next? <laughs> no, stand up front so everybody okay. can easily see. Um, I did put together a printout just so everybody can have the same understanding of what a resource conservation development council is. Um, I did not think to have a PDF copy for Brian um, to give to the folks that are on Zoom, so I will do that when I get back to the home office um, this afternoon and have it. Brian so we can send it out to the others. Um, ignore the bottom paragraph. This, I took our template form because we do this with all of our 12 counties and one of my coworkers edited it for Portage County and I didn't catch that bottom paragraph that's about working in Portage County. So, um, so first, what I want to do today, um, I'll introduce myself. I know we've got a couple new faces. Some of these I know we met last year. Um, my name is Anna Caesar. I work with Golden Sands Resource Conservation and Development Council. Um, so what I'm going to do today is give you guys an introduction to who we are as an RCD and what that means for you guys here in Wapaka County, and then um, kind of highlight some of our overall programs through Golden Sands, and then. I specifically work with aquatic invasive species, um, so I'll dive a little bit more into what my field plan is here for the upcoming summer, um, and we'll go through that. So, uh, Golden Sands, a little background information, we work with 12 counties currently in the central part of the state. Um, our goal really is to be 
the community partner for people, whether it's dealing with water related issues, um, doing different things with agriculture, woods and wildlife, and trying to kind of be that community overreach where you guys have um, Brian here at the county, but then there's some people who are on county boundaries and other things like that, and just trying to be um, an additional partner for folks um, and help offer different programs. Um, and kind of meet that bridge between there needs to be some type of economic growth, but we also try and meet that sustainability aspect at the same time. Um, we are a nonprofit. Um, and then so agriculture, um, we do have a managed grazing person on staff to help um, farmers and different agriculture producers work on um, their managed grazing programs. Um, I'll be honest, this isn't stuff I know much about. So if you have any questions, I can certainly bring them back to the, the people that work on them within Golden Sands, but this is not my, my cup of tea. Um, so different technical assistance we do offer. Um, we keep kind of a running list of where people can rent no-till drill if people are looking to get into it, but they don't want to buy them equipment themselves. Um, and then kind of on a lower local scale in within Stevens Point where our home office is located, we do have community gardens available for people as well. Um, and one of our other aspects, healthy forests um, and abundant wildlife programs, we do um, emerald ash borer, we do work with different municipalities throughout our region to kind of help put together a planning program. Um, Preparedness workshops, we have woods and wildlife for today and tomorrow. So if you own some woodland and you want to try and um, just get an idea of what you have out there, maybe what ways to protect and preserve what you have, um, putting the plants together like that. We also work with the Central Wisconsin Windshed Partners. Um, I, I'm doing different wind breaks around um, roads and the other things there. Um, and then we do have a handful of demonstration forests throughout our, our 12 county region. So um, somebody owns, uh, has, um, owns property that has a nice chunk of woodland um, and they open it up so that school groups and other recreational groups can come and learn about forests and woodlands and things like that. So then clean water, this is, this is what I know about, this is what I do. Um, we have a variety of different programs. Um, one of them is our aquatic invasive species program. That particular program works with nine counties. Um, we do a variety of things. Our focus, because this is funded through Wisconsin DNR um, surface water grant monies, um, our focus is outreach education prevention. We do help lake groups do some management and other guidance, but that's usually set aside and funded by contracted services with those lake groups. Um, the grant funds don't allow us to do management specific work, um, which means we do identification and training. Um, we'll go out and do early detection monitoring, get out in lakes that haven't been visited in a while. Um, plant surveys, both invasive and native. Um, there's a variety of statewide programs, which I'll get into in the next slide, um, and environmental education. We also have other uh, programs. Um, Friends of Little Clover River, we used to work with them to put on a kind of kids family fun education day about um, invasive species, groundwater, kind of how water interacts with us every day and, and things like that. Um, and then we do have um, our can't forget what Amy's official title is now. She was our executive director. She's now, I think, our assistant director. She's kind of stepped down as she's getting ready to leave Golden Sands in the next couple of years. Um, she did her master's project on the milfoil people. So we have invasive Eurasian water milfoil that impacts our lake flooding on different levels. And there is this native weevil or little beetle that naturally feed water milk oil plant species. So she's doing some work to try and see is there a way that we can promote the population of these weevils to help naturally um, do management for this invasive Eurasian water milk oil. So that's Golden Sands. The handout I gave you gives you a little bit of an understanding of who Golden Sands is, how we formed, kind of how we stay up and running with dues and different um, 
grant programs that we get into, um, they go a little, they give you a little more written information on some of the programs that I wrote, um, talked about up here in the presentation. Um, and a couple other programs. The other one I will add that I didn't have in the PowerPoint. So we have our aquatic invasive species grant program. Um, Golden Sands is working with Wapaka, Outagamy, um, and some other counties outside of the council area to form a terrestrial invasive species partnership group. Um, so that's written in here. It's, um, I think they're gonna be calling it Northeast Wisconsin Invasive Species Coalition. Um, so that's just kind of getting its roots started here and it will hopefully get it up and running in the next year. Um, so this gives a little bit more information about Golden Sands. I wasn't going to run through all of this. You guys can take it home and read it. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me about them. Um, and then the other thing I just want to add about Golden Sands as a whole before we get into the Aquatic Invasive Species Program, um, because we are a county um, wide group, we do ask that we keep two people from each county um, as members of the council. That way, when we have our bi-monthly um, council meetings, um, that information that what all of our programs are working on gets distributed to those two individuals who then are able to bring it back to committee like these. Um, so Bob and Brian um, are our members from Wapaka County. So thank you for you guys. And usually both of them are almost always present. Usually we have counties where it's the second person is going to back up and this thing, one person will always come back up. So, um, and we just ask that we keep those two people, some two people always present so that we always have information coming back to you guys. So any questions before I kind of jump from Golden Sands with a whole picture to a specific window? On the milfoil, yeah. you uh, put the beetle in there. When the beetle has the milfoil killed off, uh, the beetle basically disappear. Does the milfoil come back? Um, so it can It will. I mean, the 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 weevil is kind of a tricky. It's only going to work in certain lake environments. Um, weevils don't do well in places where you're going to have a ton of boat traffic traffic. If you live on a lake or have a lake that is great for water skiing, unless there's some quiet little bay that's not getting impacted by that constant wave action, the weevils aren't going to do well there. Um, and they also need, they, they live in the water, but when we're, when temperatures drop, they actually come out of the water and burrow into leaf litter over winter. So if we also if we're also on a lake that's completely developed and doesn't have any natural shoreline, or people who I think we all tend to do it, we break everything up in the fall and don't leave anything to overwinter, um, they won't be able to come back from year to year. Um, so there's some different habitat things that they do need to really be successful. Um, I'd have to talk with Amy, who's in charge of it. I, I they do feed on the different natives. So if we have a healthy native water milfoil population, um, I don't think they'll ever be able to eat so much of it that it's gone. It's just really keeping it in balance so that the rest of our native plant species are able to be present in a healthy ecosystem. They're not, I don't think we'll ever have so many weevils that they actually eat it all out. I just got a Crick that's next to my place and three, four years ago it was coated with that nice purple pink flower. And I thought it was very attractive, but then they brought the beetles in and I haven't noticed it out there, but the landowner I was talking to him and he still says that it's starting to come back hardier now. So that's actually the purple blue stripe. So the Eurasian water milfoil is one of our submergent aquatic invasive species. The purple blue stripe is one of our wetland ones, or at least it likes it have its feet wet, sometimes it's in ditches, sometimes it's around lake and shorelines. And that's the one that has that pretty pink purple um, spike flower. Um, so that also has a beetle. And the beetles we will raise, we, it's actually one of my programs here that we usually do, but because it's so volunteer based and we would have started it in April when everything was shut down, 
um, I kind of had to let that volunteer program go this spring. Um, so that one, purple loosestrife, and I should I put a different invasive species picture on here. It, it blooms in July and August, and it gets this really pretty pink purple spike flower. Um, if you were to look at it up close and you were to look at the stem, most plant stems you would assume are round. Um, it's actually squared. So that's a good indicator if you're looking at something that's blooming in July and August and it has a square stem, it's more than likely purple and stripe. Um, and it has similar characteristics of some of our lake invasive species. Um, there's a variety of wetlands where you would have all of these dozens of different plant species and then purple blue stripe comes in and it's more of a woody plant and it'll come in and it'll get seven, eight feet tall and just completely overtake the whole area. Um, and I know Chris, my coworker who does a lot of trapping, he'll notice where muskrats make their huts, they will purposely avoid the purple blue stripe and go further out of their way to bring back different plant material to make their huts. Um, so it's not really offering much habitat, um, but the beetles will raise, um, will have volunteers, will dig purple and striped roots, put them in these um, little kitty pools, put some water in there so we're creating like a wetland habitat, grow them, we'll put 10 beetles on a plant and we'll usually 10 beetles by the time they're deep done reproducing in the spring, we'll, we'll come out with roughly a thousand beetles. And then we're able to take those and go we'll put them in a wetland. And they kind of do the same thing with that these Eurasian water milkweed weevils do is that they're eating so much of the plant that it's using up the energies that it doesn't have the ability to grow as big or as robust. And um, it's just kind of keeps it short and weak and limp, allowing sunlight to get into other places and allow these other native plants to grow. So we do have the beetles. Um, that is one thing where the beetles will only eat the invasive purple blue stripe. We do have native blue stripe species, but they won't touch those. So when the purple blue stripe plant population dies back or weakens because the beetles are there, the beetles won't have anything left to feed on and, that pop and their beetle population will die back. So every couple of years, you'll probably see a reboot in plant species because the beetles have died down. Um, so yeah, you probably are seeing those come back. Um, so there are natural reoccurring populations um, in Wapaka. If you're near Shadow Lake, there's the lower park there, um, right across from that lower parking area. Um, there's a nice little marsh. There's a ton of purple blue stripe in there. Um, there are some beetles in there. Um, I usually work um, collect my beetles in a marsh down by Green Lake. Um, and then I'll usually bring them up to volunteers so that they can put them on their plants. They're, they're a fun day in the wetland when you gotta go collect about 500 of them <laughs> to distribute. Um, so looking ahead to this upcoming season, um, I'm actually planning on going out on the lake today, which is why I am so casually dressed. Um, AIS early detection monitoring. So I worked with our DNR um, staff to ask, where have you guys been in the last couple of years? so that I can plan, and where are you going this year, so that we're not double dipping um, on lakes that have been visited either by Golden Sands or DNR. Um, and these six lakes, um, Bailey, Campbell, Casey, Goodall, Keller, and Kinney are the ones that I plan on getting out on this year. Um, they haven't had any either Golden Sands or DNR staff out on them in the last three to five years. So I wanna get out there and it's just doing a visual check um, at inlets, boat landings, places where things are most likely to be trafficked um, or good places for things to um, sit and root. Um, and then just also doing a visual check of the entire shoreline around those lakes. Um, I also want to get out on the Little Wolf River this year. Um, there's a couple mill ponds that have um, flowering rush, which is the picture here. Um, if you've been out on Waiwiga at all, <laughs> That is the number one um, invasive species that if um, you're looking upstream of the river, there's, I don't know, 30, 40 acres of just flowering rush on Wyoming Lake. So there's a couple mill ponds in Wapaka County that are connected to the Blue Wolf River that I just want to um, float a, 
a good chunk of the little river to see if it's anywhere downstream of those mill ponds. Um, DNR is also working on a new program. It's called Organisms and Trade. So trying to, we have invasive species that we're trying to prevent from lake to lake, but then some of our pet stores and other places are bringing in plants for aquariums and things like that, fish, snails for the aquarium. They don't always know what's being shipped to them. Sometimes they'll get a bag of something that they can sell, but they provide the distributor had other stuff mixed in. Um, so just getting out to those, there's one in Wapaka here that I want to just go and visit this summer and kind of do a meet and greet and let them know who I am and just um, let them know that there are specific plants and animals that they cannot sell um, due to DNR state law and then just make sure that something hasn't snuck in that they weren't aware of. Um, so purple loosestrife, I already mentioned, um, it's kind of got mixed this year because of COVID-19. Clean Boats, Clean Waters is one of our other statewide programs um, that has been slowed down in terms of, it would already have been up and running with Memorial Day, that's usually our big kickoff. Um, I have an intern working with me who is supposed to do 100 hours of Clean Boats, Clean Waters across the four counties that we work with, Wapaka, Washera, Green Lake, and Marquette. Um, my counterpart, Chris, he has an intern that would spend at least 100 hours on their four to five counties that they cover. Um, the Clean Boats, Clean Waters program is trying, is guidance is to follow the statewide Badger Bounce Back Plan that they would recommend that these programs don't have watercraft inspectors out at their landings until we will, as a state are moved into phase one. Um, so that's the guidance. Golden Sands is following that guidance with our intern staff, um, but there are lake groups who have their own volunteers um, or who have their own paid staff who have the ability to go ahead and move forward with those programs as they see fit. So you may or may not see Clean Boats, Clean Waters um, watercraft inspectors in their nice blue shirt this summer at some landings now, and you might see them more later in the summer when things open up. So it's just kind of the and how each individual program is deciding to move forward with those. Um, as I mentioned, the, our AIS program right now is funded through surface water grant programs. This is kind of one of my last big things that I want to talk about. Um, and we have been supported by Wapaka County for the last, I don't know how many years we've been doing this. Um, at least three since I've been here. And I know Pack County has been with head work with other staff in the past. Um, and our lakes um, throughout the region, including Wapak County lakes have um, financially supported our grant program and our grant match dollars to keep the program up and running. Um, the DNR is moving from these competitive surface water grants to what they're calling a network. So assuming everything gets through state legislature with everything that's going on with COVID-19. Um, this upcoming fall, we're supposed to be switching from these competitive grants to a network. And what that network is, is essentially the roughly $2 million that gets divided up for all of these programs and these grants is going to be offered to every county. So they'll come to a pack of county and say, I don't know, it's Twelve to seventeen thousand dollars that we're pack the county has to do this program, and the county has the decision to say we will take that funds and we will do it as our staff, or we would like to contract somebody with these funds, or the county can say no. We've been working with Golden Sands or whatever entity. We are going to have well, though they will be our the person who does the work. The money will go straight to that entity. So we're still getting things finalized, but it, the state's still getting those um, items finalized. Um, Golden Sands has been doing our best to stay as up to date on it. And every time we get new information, we send it to Brian and our other county conservationists so that they are up to speed on it. Um, if everything's up and running come this October, those things will be in effect. Kind of the good news on that is that our grant program is going to carry us into next summer. 
So we are fully funded as staff through 2021, which means we get to watch how all of the other counties, how it works for the other counties, um, and then make the best decision for what happens. So we'll keep Brian updated on that so he guys he can keep you updated. Um, one of our other clean water programs as a water directive that we have initiative that we have with Golden Sands is groundwater education that is specifically run with Wapaka County. Um, we have an environmental educator on staff who brings these lessons to our schools. Unfortunately, these are things that are usually done with the schools in the spring. Um, and again, with COVID-19, as a lot of things have, uh, kind of got canceled. Um, Amanda, our environmental educator, was able to get into the New London School District and do one lesson there before things shut down. Um, she's tried, they've offered it as an online option, but it just didn't work well with how things, how the school being run online right now. Um, that will be again, here again next year. And then lastly, I believe my last slide is Wapaka County Conservation Field Day. Golden Sands works in um, concert with the Land Conservation Department to put on a conservation field day for fifth graders throughout the area. Um, it's coming this year, September 25th. We have gotten feedback from a lot of school districts that they've already made the decision to not do field trips in the fall, um, again, because of COVID-19. So we are changing things to do an online um, conservation field day with the schools this year. Um, we're still trying to figure out how it's all gonna work. Typically, we'd have myself doing aquatic and basic CCs, and we'd have somebody from UW Extension Lakes doing lake life, and we'd have somebody from NRCS talk about soil health, and we'd have um, somebody doing furs and trappers education, wild, um, different, all different kinds of conservation, outdoor related jobs, and, and efforts that kids get to learn about. So I believe that's, and these are some pictures from a couple of years ago. Um, otherwise, that's all I have. My contact information is there. If anybody has any questions now or down the road, please feel free to give me a call or shoot me an email. Any questions? All right, thank you. Thank you. Whoop, come back, I'll get forget. What, Bob? No, I was yelling at my wife because the picture went away and I don't know what number of buttons to push to make things better. Thank you, Anna, for all you do. Uh, my Lake District is a big participant in everything that comes from Golden Sands, including the paychecks for the people who we hire to check boats as they're entering the chain. And so you guys do a wonderful job. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll actually be about on the water on the chain today. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. I'll be out on the chain this afternoon. Maybe I'll see you. Oh, good. <laughs> oh, good. Come pester me. <laughs> OK, thank you. Moving on, multi-discharger variants, if any. So I think two months ago, we had talked about this program and somebody had suggested that I come back with a little bit of presentation since we kind of forgotten about it. Um, it was something we had talked about quite a bit at the end of 2017 and 2018 when the program came into play. And while I think we all had high hopes for it, you know, it's, it's been a bit of a non-factor in Wapaka, while other counties have had a much different experience. It's basically due to the funding um, and how it's distributed. So this is the, the statewide, what we call MDV, multi-discharger variance. And what it really is, is uh, a phosphorus program that looks at giving the wastewater treatment facilities uh, another option instead of spending money on brick and mortar um, changes in order to meet their permit. So this would be for sewage treatment plants, um, Sarah Lee in New London, uh, 
uh, you know, meat, meat packing facilities, anybody that's got a pipe discharge to waters of the state. Um, the paper mills in the valley would be another example. Um, so all of these have a, have a DNR permit. They're permitted as a point source discharge. And this program allows them to, uh, instead of making changes to meet lower standards in their permit, um, it allows them to pay a fee to the counties, to the county land conservation departments for us to turn that money around and, and gain the same or better results with farmers. Um, you, you know, the, the, the real factor going on here is that there's quite a bit more phosphorus pollution going on in the non-point world with farms than there is with the point source. The point sources have been heavily regulated for 30, 40 years now. Um, and what comes out of their pipe is uh, well, generally required to be less than 0 0.075 parts per million. Um, and we certainly see worse things going on in, in the egg world. So um, the basics of the program, it was approved in, in 2017 by the EPA and, and Wisconsin. Um, not all wastewater treatment facilities are eligible for MDV. They must uh, apply for it um, up to a year in advance and, the, and DNR must approve their, their application. Um, they have to have these MDV requirements in their permit. So if uh, memory serves me, these permits are on a five year rotation. So a wastewater treatment facility has to have a new permit every five years. And this program is good until 2027. So the wastewater treatment facility agrees to reduce phosphorus discharge from their pipe in whatever manner they can as they're working through their permit and as they have this variance. So they're still supposed to be working towards a, a reduction because come 2027, they have to meet their permit number even though they may have exceeded it the past 10 years by paying money to us, the county. Um, to, to find other ways to reduce pollution. In the end, if the state and the EPA don't renew the program, they're gonna be stuck doing those brick and mortar changes or chemical changes, or however they may get to the, the effluent level they need to be at. Um, and then they need to implement a, a watershed project, um, which really comes down to either they can do this themselves, and I think by and large, they've chosen not to because it means they have to contract with an environmental firm, um, which would be that third party to implement a watershed project, or they'd have to hire their own people. You know, if it was a city of Oshkosh treatment facility, they'd have to hire staff just to do the type of work we do. And, and so by and large, they've picked up on the last option at the bottom here, which is paying counties to implement egg practices to reduce phosphorus loading in the same watershed. So our participation is voluntary. I know there's a fair amount of counties that haven't chosen to participate either because they didn't feel the funding level was worth it or they didn't have the staff to do it. I think most of the counties in Northeast Wisconsin have applied. Um, we have each of the last two years. So, um, so we, so we do receive these additional financial resources that we're talking about here. This is how we're allowed to use them. We, we have to use 65% of the money we receive to go into a project, into a hard practice or a soft practice, whether it's building a sediment basin in the field or putting cover crops on or whatever the case may be, uh, harvestable buffers those types of things that show a phosphorus reduction off of a field. We are allowed to use up to 35% of it for staffing or monitoring or modeling. Um, you know, right now we're not getting enough money that I don't think it's worth the paperwork to take that. However, you know, I, we've received, this year we received about $7,400 from two different entities. Um, one is Sarah Lee in New London, and the other is the Pine River 
for Poissippi Sewage District. So here's kind of a timeline of, of how this works, um, at, at least from the first year. Basically, we apply each January for, by January 1st to receive the funds. The funds came to us in February and March via an actual check from these entities, goes into our budget. We have to have a watershed plan on how we're gonna use this. We happen to have three nine key element watershed plans in the county that we've done in the past couple of years that qualify um, and then, so we have to go out and use the money in a project and then do some reporting on it at the end. I am going to try to share a different screen here once. This is a, a map of how the money is theoretically split up. So if you have several entities in a watershed that have to pay this, you have a total facility amount. Um, and then counties that have applied to take the money are the ones that split it up. So in this case, the, the example is Dodge, Washington and Waukesha get this money, but it's distributed um, proportionally to how much acreage they have in the watershed. So this watershed they're showing is probably the lower Rock River or something of that nature. And, and then if they've got $1.2 million, it gets split up like this. Those are pretty high dollar amounts. The only place I know that that's happened is with the city of Fond du Lac. Um, last year, Fond du Lac County had over $100,000 in funding from this program. Winnebago County had about 60,000. Calumet County had a, a portion of that too. Um, otherwise, it's, it's been more minimal. Like I said, for us this year, it was about $7,400. So, so getting into the weeds a little bit here, um, you know, we, we're supposed to target the places within the county that have the worst problems. We've done that by creating these nine key element watershed plans already. Um, I had to submit a, a financial budget to, through DNR's program this year on where we were gonna use the money. Um, so I submitted it in one of those watershed areas, it happens to be north of Manama in the Simcoe area. Um, I guess if you get into large amounts, they, they want you to spend 10% of it on planning. We've already spent that money in the last two to three years on planning these projects outside of the MDV program. Um, there, there's many reasons why we do this watershed planning to bring other sources of funding to the county. And then in the end, after we do uh, implement a project, we have to do the reporting in the DNR system on what we spent and what the estimated phosphorus reduction was from that project, because um, that number goes against the, the phosphorus loading in the watershed that would have been lost by the wastewater treatment facilities not doing additional chemical treatment or not building an additional treatment facility of brick and mortar per se within their system. So, um, DNR has to post the, the, the results online each year. I don't know that we've started to see that yet. We're essentially in year two of this happening. We've got a little bit of money in 2018 that comes to us in 2019. We got that $7,400 from 2019 that we just received this spring. We've waited with the 18 money to combine the funds uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of $10,000 we have to do a couple of specific projects now that will have to have to be completed this year. Any questions? Either it was thorough or thoroughly confusing. Well, I, I think for those that are new here, uh, Brian, this was a state initiative to reduce phosphorus a few years back, like you said. And um, it, it is quite involved. <laughs> 
it was a, one way to try to avoid for some of the municipalities to spend a lot of money on their updating their facilities. So whether we're going to be successful from the agricultural standpoint remains to be seen. One question: How does human waste compare to the north? Uh, which has gotten more possible? Uh, my second question is: I see uh, big takers going into a lot of sewage treatment plant with farm waste. I'm sure, but I, I question that along the phosphate. And, how the city can handle that in their system, unless I'm way out there, I don't know. I think most of what you're seeing is treatment coming from like cheese plants and stuff. Occasionally they'll take that to the city. All of any farms that are willing to pay the price that a treatment facility would charge them. Um, it's possible occasionally it happens. Oh, really? Yeah, well, I, I think it's there. I didn't know if you were what you knew about. I, I don't know of any instances yeah, that it's happening. Yeah. yeah. And you know, you look at these manure lagoons that we build on these farms. I mean, you know, three, four million gallons is small nowadays. Um, that would be a pretty huge load for a city to take on with the amount of solids that are in there. Because then the city has to find a place to spread that cake too. I mean, they're spreading it, not land spreading it, much like the farms are, um, with their own set of restrictions. It's a, you know, manure is a very expensive ordeal. Um, not that the farms have any choice. They, I think, in the next decade, we'll see more technology on how to dewater stuff. I mean, the amount of when you figure that that manure is at, at a minimum 92% water in that tanker, they've got to find a way to quit hauling that much water up and down our roads. It's just causing so many other issues. Um, there are some systems around the state. I know we toured one down in Sheboygan um, um, where they're separating the water out. But by and large, it's, you know, Land spread even still their cheapest option. So. Okay, move on to the next item. All right, so um, as you most of you know, we have this large scale trim grant for the Bear Lake area that started this year and is good for three years, possibly a fourth. Um, and so this is the first time in, in many years um, since 2008, to be exact, that we've had state cost sharing for what we term soft practices, which would be uh, um, implementing no-till, implementing cover crops, implementing harvestable buffers, uh, things of that nature that we have not had cost share for in, in 12 plus years. And the cover crops have become a, a really big ticket. I mean, the demo farm networks have been pushing this, NRCS has been pushing this. And we now have a couple hundred thousand dollars available in Bear Lake over the next three years um, for practices like this. Uh, DNR came out early last month with a new version of uh, administrative rule NR 154 which is the rule that sets cost share rates for their programs. And they bumped up the cost share rate for cover crops to a maximum of $70 an acre. There are places where that's an appropriate number and there are scenarios where that's a way overpayment, depending on what kind of cover crop you're putting in. So um, like out of Gamey County has done before us, I put together this, this rate since we, we have a number of farms waiting to sign contracts for this fall for cover crops. Um, I spent quite a bit of time last week with, with Lisa, with Derek from NRCS, with Matt Bruger, who's our contracted agronomist with uh, the demo farm project. And we kind of put our heads together and came up with this schedule 
for what would be appropriate cost sharing for cover crops um, along with a, a no-till component into next spring. And this was the rate we came up with on the sheet that I handed out here. Um, however, we should have committee approval of any time we're setting rates like this. Any questions? I can kind of go through this. I think it's somewhat self-explanatory. A, a single non-wintering species would be like oats. Um, that somebody for cover crop. Yeah, NRCS standards say that if you're going to do that, you have to have that planted before September 1st, which makes it not terribly popular because most of the time corn silage is off by then. There's not a lot of scenarios you do that. Um, we're more likely to get into the second and third one where you have a single overwintering species that would be a, a rye, winter rye, um, barley, triticale, things like that. Um, some different planting deadlines on here. November 1st is the absolute last deadline we're allowed to make a payment on for cover crop. Um, we'd certainly like them to be in before that, which is why you see a little higher incentive rate on the earlier date. Um, the fourth line down is still a, a single species that would be interseeded. Um, I know we saw look at some interseeding demonstrations in the demo farm projects last year out of Dan Burst. Um, there's a lot of aerial seeding going on to the south of us. I don't know that that's super popular in Wapaka, although there is a, a plane over in the Plover area, I believe, Craig, a guy that does aerial seeding over there. So there could be some of that in our neighborhood. Um, and then the, the last couple of lines are for multi-species cover crops, which is what we're really trying to promote. Um, it would be assumed that those would be interseeded because most of those have to be in at a date prior, at least if they're in corn, prior to the corn coming off. So that would be interseeding um, or aerial applications. Uh, and then if the farm chooses to not plow that under, you know, we would encourage them to know till end of those cover crops the following season, uh, they'd get that last $10 an acre to, to possibly hit a $70 an acre rate depending on how they went about that. So that was what we came up with, at least for this year. We're gonna need a motion to approve this. I would make that motion. Bob, is there a second? I'll second it. Great. Motion to make it second it to approve this list and the way I understand it will be probably reviewed after the end of the year. Yes. All the question, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 <laughs> Any opposition? Motion's carried. Thank you. All right, item 13, our standard contract <laughs> approval. Um, what we have this month would be uh, a couple of no-till contracts for the Bear Lake watershed. Uh, Jeff Henschel at 79 acres and Chris Rickman at 53 acres for this season. Um, and the, the rate stayed the same in NR154, that's an $18.50 an acre payment for switching to no-till on eligible fields. So those contracts should get approval. Okay, we need a motion on that. I will make that motion, Jim Nygaard, motion to approve. Thank you, is there a second? I'll second. We've got a motion and a second to approve those two. Any further discussion? Call the question. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing, hearing none, motion is carried. Thank you. Okay. Uh, other things going on. So, probably a staff update first. Um, our <clears throat> secretary or administrative position. Uh, Ann is back today. She's been on furlough for 10 weeks due to the, the COVID situation. So this is her first day back. Um, I, you know, depending on how many of you and which committees you're on, but I, there was a department head chat going on this morning that I had to, to leave to get into this meeting, but we've been you know meeting two or three times a week via Zoom, and it looks like Throughout the month of June, we'll be bringing employees back. Um, you know, they've almost the entire second floor of the, the 
the health and human services floor have been working from home or whatever the case may be. Our particular department um, and staff and are still doing some work from home yet a little bit this month. Um, but as field work picks up, it's more or less everybody's been in the office, uh, either, either out in the field or, or doing what they need to do. We still need to cover some ground on how we're going to deal with uh, in-person appointments since that's a big part of our deal, especially for the nutrient management work that Stefan does. Uh, a lot of the planning work Corey does, you know, we have one, two, three farmers sit in their office for three, four, five hours at a time sometimes. Um, we're going to have to figure out a slightly different way to go about that for the foreseeable future. I've looked at, we have that little conference room off to the side of the parks office there. I think we can set up a workstation in there with a plexiglass shield that we could do some one-on-one -on -one with. I know Ron from maintenance had talked to her. They're looking at installing plexiglass shields throughout first floor in all of our offices at the front counters, um, like you see popping up pretty much everywhere we go these days. So, uh, so that, that's really the one of the bigger things we're dealing with. Um, we did clean out lower level room 23 down around the corner here. Um, if you go back to the mid nineties, that was a, a second land conservation office. We had so many people working in this office. They didn't fit upstairs. So we had four people down there. Um, we vacated that in 2007 and have been using it as a second storeroom ever since. And now planning and zoning will be putting the building inspectors in there that they've contracted with. So we emptied out our stuff, moved all our stuff into LL39, which is our normal storeroom and turn that room back over to maintenance. I see they tore the carpet out and painted it last week. So it's a lot different. Um, Craig and I can tell the story that we were sitting in that room together in 2001 when the, when the planes hit the buildings in New York. Because that's one of those life moments where you remember where you were, right? Um, Otherwise, uh, DNR complaints and actions, it's been very quiet this spring without a lot of runoff and rain events. We didn't have a lot of new complaint work. Um, waiting for Eric to follow, Eric from DNR to follow up on a couple of older complaints um, based around nutrient management plans and spreading violations. Most of that back from last December probably yet. Um, just about have a buffer contract template done for our harvestable buffer pilot project with the Department of Ag. Um, I had sent something to them last week and I would hope to hear back from them today um, so we can get those signed. That's really about it. Um, we've got quite a few projects going on, just not a lot of big projects. I don't anticipate we're going to be doing much big egg waste or manure storage this year. We didn't have many contracted. There's one being finished up yet from previous year, but we have a lot of field erosion control, a lot of basins out there this year, um, stone shoots, wetland restorations, more of that type of stuff going on, uh, at least in, in the last few years. So. And that's due to the Bear Lake funding, both through leases programs and through our project that Bear Lake project area has had a lot of good funding out there for the landowners and we've seen an increase um, in funds for that and I think we're going to see that same increase in the uh, um, next watershed north of it in the Shaw Creek area around Simcoe um, especially if we if we get our large-scale trim grant there for next year that would make that available too. a lot of those Farms are crossing the watershed boundary in their operations. Always difficult to explain to them why they're eligible for something on one side of the hill and not on the other, but that's the way we operate, so. Okay. Um, I don't know, Ryan, if you did have the science sheet at all. I've got, yeah, I've got them both right here, this month and last month. <laughs> Last month just needs you to sign, Dwayne, okay. the rest of them. Um, 
I also have a meeting announcement this Friday will be our Lake Winnebago Association meeting that normally would have happened in a county with some presentations that's going to be by Zoom and there's not going to be a lot mostly it's to elect representatives to the state association we have to have those election results in by the end of the month so um, I'll send that out in an email if anybody wants to join that if they have time at nine o'clock on Friday morning um, however I don't know that it's going to be too exciting other than possibly some DNR and debt gap updates, there's really not much on the agenda. Anything else before we adjourn? Otherwise, our next meeting would more than likely be on the first. Oh, you got something. I, I just got a question about last month. I see you did have something about the Wagner Farm. I guess I didn't get much out of it. We were kind of looking into it. Yeah, I had actually forwarded it to Diane for citation last month. Um, I have not touched back base with her to see where that's at. There have been quite a bit of changes there since then. You know, we had difficulty with them all spring. Um, Eric and I, Eric from DNR and I had met out there end of January um, with Mike. At the time, he had a lot of winter runoff. There were big manure piles all over the barnyard. Um, we had talked about him doing some temporary mitigation until he can figure out whether he's going to build anything for the DNR grant or not. And he just basically refused to cooperate. Um, you know, I, the Spiegelberg implement was willing to help him out a little bit and do some temporary stuff that never got done. Um, so I had just kind of forwarded on to Diane and said, you know, we're, we're kind of at wit's end with this guy. He doesn't want to do what he's been to do. So now, since then, he's moved all the manure piles. The animals are out on pasture. Um, there is still runoff during rain events coming off the barnyard, but the situation is better. The only reason it's better is because it's a seasonal issue. I mean, nothing would change. If nothing gets done between now and fall, we'll be looking at the same situation going in the winter. Um, so we'll probably be continue continuing to push for citation at that point. I drove past there this morning got manure pile on the north side of the barn. Yeah. But he's got a three, four foot uh, slot of manure running down the right. ditch yet. And we had asked him to move the manure pile to the north side um, instead of it had been piled next to that silo where the three or four foot wide swath is there and was constantly contributing to that runoff. So you know those those were some positive changes, but it it didn't occur because he did it on purpose. It, it became a, a timely convenience for him, basically, in, in my opinion, so. Where they're located? On uh, your road, just west of Manawa, corner of your road and, and Wolf Road, be the Mike Wagner farm, Ella Wagner. You only have like five or six animals right now? Uh, no, there's probably over 30 at this point again now. Yeah, yeah, he's got them down the hill of the pasture, so you didn't see them, and the young ones are in the barn. Um, supposedly, he's milking like 20 animals. I have no idea what he's doing with the milk. And the only reason I know that they pick up milk from that many animals is because it's the same guy picking milk up from the next farm down the road, which is Dan Burse. But just to uh, back up a little bit for Ken and Cindy, this has a, been an ongoing issue. DNR issued what they call a notice of discharge, um, which is basically the first step in their enforcement process. Um, but state law says that we, that, that DNR or the county has to offer cost share in order to remedy these, these issues if the farm um, was in existence since 2002. DNR did offer them uh, grant money um, through us, you know, we're, we're the grant arm of DNR. We're, we're the people that act as the, the money and the uh, technical staff to work with them. Uh, so there's a grant on the table. Um, however, he has to still come up with 10% of the project cost and he's not been able to do that. So you know, we're kind of at the standstill where nothing's going on. DNR is somewhat more patient than we are at this point, I think, because 
he went out of business after getting the grant. Things were good for six, eight months when there were no cattle there. Then he came back into business again, which we didn't kind of expect, I don't think would happen. Um, financially, I'm not sure how this place makes ends, ends meet, but that's generally not our concern, so. I'm sorry, Brian. Would that be classified like in a watershed area? Yeah, this is in the Bear Lake watershed. Um, you know, everything is in some watershed. This particular instance, there's a waterway that comes right off the concrete barnyard um, through a little patch of field, gets into the town road ditch, goes through a town culvert. At that point, it's concentrated flow. So what DNR does, um, when the initial complaint was made, DNR came out and did water testing. They tested at the road culvert, which is probably uh, 100, 150 yards from the barnyard. Then they have to go down, they have to follow the channel, it runs down a couple of road ditches on some town roads and then crosses into the Little Wolf River, um, just above the Lions Park there where the rodeo is. And they have to go down to the confluence of that waterway where it comes into the river. They have to test upstream and downstream to prove that it's getting there. Um, so they've done all that. Those numbers exist. They're extremely high numbers. Um, that was the basis for their, their notice of discharge. Um, eventually, DNR goes through an enforcement process with this, but DNR is very short-staffed in their environmental program. Um, so they sort of pick and choose things by how bad they are. This is certainly bad enough to, to be on their radar, but they don't operate very quickly. You know, as long as there's been some progress and, and in their eyes, the progress was applying for the grant, getting the grant. Now that the guy's not doing the things he's, he's been asked to do, I would expect maybe towards the end of the year, DNR will bring him in for what they call an enforcement conference. That's usually a, a get together of DNR's lawyers and the landowner's lawyers try to come to some agreement if that goes nowhere then eventually dnr cites them but in our county in recent years i can only think of of one citation that's been issued through this so it's, it's unlikely generally they get resolved i mean we've we have a lot of notices of discharge in the county i mean that occurs probably two three times a year with farms but Generally, they take grant money that's offered to them and fix their problem and move on. So this is a case where that's not happened. Yeah, it's, not, it's not a simple situation in this case. And no. Primarily, it's unfortunate, but uh, the individual does not have the financial means to. One of the maddening things about our world is that we cannot go through enforcement with these farms without offering cost sharing grants to fix the problem. The good part of that is it usually fixes the problem. The bad part is it takes time. Are we rewarding people for doing things they shouldn't do? Yeah, you could look at it like that. Um, but those are the those are the laws in the state of Wisconsin. There's, been very little change to them in 20 years. Any other questions before we adjourn? Otherwise, yes, I have one. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, this is a question for Anna. Do you need transportation on the water today if you're visiting the chain? My boat is sitting here empty. I appreciate that, Bob. My kayak is loaded on the top of my car and my intern's probably waiting for me at the landing with his, but thank you. Okay. Our next meeting, I think you wanted to take a gas and said we Our next meeting was scheduled for the first Monday of July, I believe. Yeah, Dwayne, do you know what the county schedule is for our days off? Set that yet or? I don't know offhand either. Well, what is Monday the first, the first Monday? It's the sixth. The fourth falls on a Saturday, so I'm guessing we'll have Friday the third off. Okay. So I think the sixth is doable unless you're 
Okay, and not to my knowledge, I think the sixth of those grand jury. We are we are adjourned. <laughs> Let's make sure everybody signs these next to their initials before you run off. Please get paid. Got some stuff that you want me to take away from you? You got room? I'll have a table at the pool bar. Yeah, I don't know if you're going to want the pools, but you can take the rest of the stuff. And then I don't know if I'll help anything. Sean's got a pickup truck. So if he's willing to come back this way before heading out, we'll swing by the office. And okay. You guys have to get to work ready? Four usually. Okay, I'm going to try that. And if we're not, I'll come back later this week. I'll have to come back up next week. This is the one person we need to be done. This was from last month. Well, they already got paid. We just didn't turn it paid for them. Uh, me? I would do. Oh, well, wait a minute. Oh, wait, they did. Just going to be well, that's serious. I already know it's cold here last time. Oh, maybe, maybe we went to cut. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure how far your schedule is. Yeah. My guard's right in the water. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Scattered thunderstorms are pushing off. It's going to be hot as they say it's going to be this summer. It's going to be. I can go. Well, I mean, you think about.